Coming up today, hundreds of extra pounds were hurting Jennifer Williams physically and mentally. But a change on the outside requires a change on the inside. See the work that's needed before and after weight loss surgery. And a little bit later, it will be wet and windy for the Chiefs game this weekend. We catch up with two doctors traveling with the team to Baltimore. Good morning, I'm Jessica Lovell and welcome to the Morning Medical Update. Jennifer Williams tried to lose weight, and she did. But the 100 or so pounds that she lost came back. Then she lost it again, then it came back again, and it continued that way until last year when she decided it was finally time for a permanent change. Janine Kiesling shows us how losing weight off her body also lifted weight off her shoulders. The last year has been quite a journey for Jennifer Williams. It started with gastric bypass surgery, but the real changes Jennifer made came from within, and she says she couldn't have done it without the help of her team at the University of Kansas Health System. I was very active as a child. I was in sports, I ran track, I played volleyball, I was on dance team in college. Jennifer Williams has always been happy and outgoing, but the more weight she put on, the more she felt herself shrinking on the inside. It was rough because I'm, I'm a bubbly, happy person all the time and I constantly was putting myself in the background of stuff. I didn't ever want to kind of stand out. Jennifer's physical health was also suffering and her weight was making it tough to do her job as an elementary school librarian. I would have horrible back spasms and leg cramps and I couldn't stand for as long as I wanted. I couldn't interact the way I wanted. It was Jennifer's primary care doctor who brought up the idea of gastric bypass surgery. So Jennifer did what any good librarian would and started researching programs. She attended an online event the University of Kansas Health System held to educate herself about her options when it came to weight loss surgery. Jennifer was so impressed she immediately called and made an appointment with Dr. Sydney Hugh for gastric bypass. When I went and talked to her, she was not sure coding anything. She was saying, this is just a tool. You have to still change your lifestyle. It's not something you're just gonna have happen and it's gonna fix everything. If you're committed to doing this, you can be successful. Jennifer says having an entire team with her every step of the way from a nutritionist to a counselor made all the difference. The whole staff, the whole experience was awesome down there. And Jennifer Williams is here in studio with us today. We are so glad to have you. Thank you. Thanks for Thank sitting you. here with me. And joining us virtually is Dr. Ashley Rhodes and Nicolette Jones. Dr. Rhodes is a health psychologist, someone who provides behavioral health services before and after weight loss surgeries. Nicolette is a clinical dietitian specialist who helps patients make sure that their diet matches their medical needs. So Jennifer, um, we just saw some before and after pictures in, in that story. You look fantastic. How are you feeling? I'm, I'm feeling so much better. I feel so much lighter. I feel like I can do so many more things that I should be able to do for my age. I felt that my weight was really hindering a lot of things I wanted to do. You said you felt older. I felt so much older. Explain what was going on inside your head when you say older. I know you said you felt slower. Right. Just getting in and out of cars, getting in to be able to do my daily job as my librarian with all my kids, being around my kids at school, um, having time with my own children. Um, we recently went on vacation and um, we went out to Colorado and I was able to do so much hiking with my daughter. It was wonderful. Um, just so many things I was missing out in life because of my weight was holding me back and now I'm able to do so many more things. It's like a whole new life. Oh, absolutely. So when did you have the surgery and, and how much weight have you lost since? Um, I had it June 13th of 2022. So I'm a um, little bit over 18 months out. I've lost, um, from my highest, I've lost 200 pounds. From surgery, I've lost 183. Right. And we were talking before the show, and, and I mentioned you'd lost 100 pounds and mm -hmm. then you gain it back, 100 yep. pounds and gain yep. it back. Yep. What is it like to lose 100 pounds several times in your life? That it's, is a big feat. I think it's very it's very <laughs> scary, to be quite honest. Now that I'm at this part of my life, I feel like, oh my gosh, am I gonna have to gain it back? But the support that I get through Dr. Rhodes and other people has really helped me um, change that mindset of, oh, always being the fearfulness of the gaining the weight back because it was always a pattern of up and down, up and down, up and down. Well, and, uh, and to be clear, the up and down wasn't the part that stood out to me. It was just the fact that you were able, able to do 
do that several times to lose 100 pounds. That's, yeah. that's a lot of yeah. hard work. So it is a lot of hard work. That's a big deal. It is a lot of hard work. From my perspective. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, but we do know that people gain it back. So I want to talk on the physical and then we'll jump into mm -hmm. the mental. But what have been the biggest uh, changes in your physical health since the, the, the surgery? You said, you know, you're able to travel. But again, as a, somebody who works in a school and you're yeah. running around after oh, yeah. children all day, what's that been like? I don't have leg cramps every night. I don't have back spasms all the time. I'm able to walk as much as I absolutely want to. I'm able to race around chasing the kids sometimes in my library. Um, it's it's really totally life changing. I feel so much better every day. How many steps are you getting in? About fifteen thousand a day. That's a lot. Between about twelve and fifteen thousand, depending and, on the day. And um, you were having to walk those halls and run the, with those kids with all that weight oh, yeah. on. So it was much really much hard. different now. Very much different. So mentally, you mentioned that you were putting yourself in the background. We mm -hmm. hear that a lot with people who are maybe aren't who are feeling self conscious. Um, how was? your body impacting your mental health. Oh, it was horrible. I was I felt so bad because I literally took myself out of pictures with my children for years. I wasn't in pictures with them because I always hated seeing myself in pictures. I hated seeing myself being videotaped or anything. Like this would never have happened. <laughs> you sitting here with ago. me on TV no. would never happen. No, 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 no. This never would have happened. Um, but I have I'm been able to um, adjust my thinking to the point that I'm I'm feeling comfortable in my skin now. Well, let's turn to Dr. Rhodes. Anyone who uh, gets a weight loss surgery is required to meet with a psychologist before they ever have an operation. Tell us why that is and what those discussions are like in some of those first meetings, Dr. Rhodes. Sure, um, so this is a comprehensive evaluation. We talk about a little bit of everything. We usually start with some basic background information. We talk about history with weight. We talk about mental health history, substance use history, and of course, more about the surgery itself. The lifestyle changes that are required um, as you're going through this surgery, making sure they fully understand kind of the risks benefits. Um, we also look at things like social support. Um, and we know that all of these things help us develop a plan tailored to each individual to help hopefully help them get the most benefit from surgery short and long term. So we combine that with written assessments and create our plan from there. And it takes, uh, you know, a lot for someone just to get to you to make that decision, to make that huge, huge change. But how do you help counsel somebody through somebody who maybe has feel, felt like, you know, felt let down by themselves because diet and exercise hasn't worked in the past? It's a great question. Um, a lot of times there is guilt and shame around this. As a society, uh, we don't do a great job of understanding the very complex and chronic condition of obesity. There's still, frankly, a lot we have to learn about it. Um, but it's, we know that it's much more complex um, than calories in, calories out, for example. Uh, there are so many factors that go into this process. And so we really try to destigmatize um, and kind of demit some of these processes to help people know that there is support, whether it's through surgery or a different route. So what are the biggest issues that a patient needs to be prepared for mentally? Boy, there are several. Um, I'd say the overall lifestyle changes that we're asking of people, that's not a one size fits all approach. So we might say, here are all of these recommendations. And what I try to do is help people figure out, along with uh, Nicolette, work closely with her, how does this fit into people's day to day lives? Everyone's got a different um, lifestyle, different routine. How can we make some of these changes really work for them? And understand that that may change over time as well. Um, and I'd say the other thing is a body image is a very, very complex idea. That's our automatic thoughts, images, emotions that show up when we think about ourselves. Um, and that's not a straightforward process when it comes to the surgery. So that's another big area of support that we try to forecast throughout the entire process. Jennifer, what do you remember from those conversations with Dr. Rhodes? Totally exactly what she's talking about. You, you lose your weight so incredibly quickly that your brain takes so much longer to catch up with where your body is at. And she was huge for me for that. There was many times I was in her office and we were talking about this because it was really a difficult thing. You know, and then you'd have a stall and then you think, okay, is this all I'm going to have? And then you think, no, I can change something in my diet or I can do something different. And get yourself going again. But your body image and understanding where you're at is, it really changes well, fast. What was it like making the connection between what was in your head and what and the woman you were seeing in the mirror? It's still hard. I'm going to be quite honest. There's still some days I look at the mirror and I see the faults. I don't see the, 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 um, the progress I've made. And I see um, other things. It's just, it's a constant, 
it's a battle. It truly is a battle. That would be a battle because you're constantly hearing people like me walk in and say, oh my gosh, you look amazing, right. you look gorgeous. Mm -hmm. No one would even think that you had any yes. issues with this before. And yes. you're thinking, oh, oh you have no gosh. idea what I've been going exactly, through. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, have you ever had to deny somebody a surgery? And how do you make that decision? Sure. Um, I think it's a common misconception that there's sort of a pass fail when it comes to this process. Um, really, there's it's very, very rare that we'll identify things that make someone not a candidate at that exact time that can't be modified. Um, so I really think of our goal is how can we identify those risk factors? For example, if someone has an active eating disorder, um, active untreated significant mental health or substance use issues, those are things that we'd want to address prior to surgery. So we might say, hey, we don't want to proceed right at this moment. How can we get supports in place for you so that down the road, we know we can do this not only safely, but also uh, with the best chance of those short and long-term outcomes. And do you follow patients post-surgery? I do, yes. Actually, the evaluations are a small part of what I do. There's a group of us who do the evaluations. Uh, my main role is in our bariatric surgery clinic, getting to see people pre and post-surgery, whether it's preparing for the surgery or helping with that adjustment, whether it's within that first year or sometimes years down the road. So you know, just from an expert perspective, you know, we're hearing from Jennifer, but from an expert perspective, help us kind of take us inside the mind of someone who you're having these conversations with and they walk into your office and you're like, you look great, but you know in their mind something else entirely is going on differently in there. Sure, uh, so what, one example, like I never will ask people about their weight. There's a lot of focus on that in the process elsewhere. Um, I'm careful actually to not even make comments about anyone's physical appearance, knowing that for some people that can feel really great and supportive, and for others, even that attention on themselves um, is uncomfortable um, or attention towards their appearance. So I really try to take a um, non-judgmental, not making assumptions approach, um, going in with the ex knowledge that everyone has a different experience with this. So I view my role as trying to kind of walk alongside that with them and be a support provider for whatever's showing up. Okay, you just totally stopped me in my tracks because you're saying that when somebody has gone down this journey that it might not be the right thing to say is, oh, you look great. Oh, how much weight have you lost? It, what are we supposed to ask? And what are we supposed to say to someone who, is, who has gone through this big change? It's an excellent question, um, and it's, again, there's really not a one-size-fits-all approach there. Those same questions might feel great to one person and feel really uncomfortable to another. And I think often uh, people who maybe have someone in their lives going through this, they want to be really supportive. And so if we can not acknowledge that sometimes that support may not be the way that that person feels supported, ask, mm -hmm. right? Ask that person, what do you want me to right. say? What, what feels supportive for you personally? All right, Jennifer, I'm going to ask you then. So mm -hmm. do you get tired of people telling you how great you look or do you want them to ask you, how are you feeling? You know what? I like both, to be quite mm -hmm. honest, because I did have some medical issues. You know, I have heart issues, stuff and the knee issues, my osteoarthritis issues. So how I'm feeling is a good thing, too. But I, I am proud. I am yeah. proud of what I've done so far. Um, you know, the support of my family, the support of my husband and my kids, and I have two very good friends, and I have a great administrator, great staff that I work with at my school. They've all been so supportive, and they're so kind. Um, so having that support and having them even question how I'm doing or even when I'm having a hard day, you know, I have a good friends that check in on me. So that's good. Good. Check in on people. So we know when we talk about gastric bypass, it, uh, something that comes up is the diet changes, oh, the way yeah. you eat, how much you eat, when you eat. So you actually let us come into your pantry there in your <laughs> home. Uh, you were making a strawberry protein shake, but tell us like what, what's your daily diet like post-surgery? What kind of challenges has it posed or has it been kind of a fun challenge? You, you know, I'm a very regimented kind of person. I am super regimented. So like in the morning after I get up and exercise, I have my shake. And then for lunch, I have my certain thing that I eat. I think what's mostly changed is like when we go out as a family, um, luckily my daughter and I will split an entree or I order off the children's menu a lot of times too. I focus so much on my protein goals. I track it on my little, I, my phone is tracked. Everything that goes in my mouth is tracked on my phone. So I, I'm very conscientious about what I'm eating and what I'm putting in my body every day. And do you find yourself going back and going, I never would have done this oh, before? No. 
no, Com no. Complete 180. Yeah, it's definitely different. So we're gonna talk with your dietitian, Nicolette, but what have you learned from her? What tips have you learned and what's been useful? The protein goals, mm -hmm. making sure I keep my protein goals up because I, when you hit a stall and you're thinking, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? She just encourages you to do, to do your protein, make sure you're getting your protein goals, make sure you're drinking your water, which I drink, I don't drink any soda. I haven't had soda in two years. Okay. Um, I drink water all the time. And um, I think it's just knowing how much your body can take is another thing that you have to learn through this process, like how much food you can intake, because sometimes your mind is still like, oh, wow, I can eat that. No, I can't. So um, Yeah, your brain tells you one thing, your right. stomach tells you something else. Right, and then growing up, always you have to yeah. clean your plate. You have to always make sure all your food is gone. Getting over that mindset, too, yeah. has been something that's been fun. Yeah, a lot of Different. us grew, grew up that way. So, Nicolette, yeah. let's bring you into this conversation. I'm sure you have tips that we can all use, but how? what's your role? How do you guide patients to stay on course after surgery? Yeah, so I am involved in kind of every step of the process uh, after surgery as they go through um, a specific diet progression for our center's guidelines and then kind of navigating, okay, you're back to eating regular meals. What should those look like? Um, and tailoring that to their specific needs, their schedule, their job, um, and what they tolerate. So there are a lot of different types of foods that may or may not be well tolerated after surgery. And so kind of navigating um, some texture difficulty, uh, coaching on, um, you know, obviously getting that protein in, that hydration, um, and a lot of troubleshooting some, you know, digestive issues that may arise and also food aversions. Appetite can be, uh, a, a, you know, changed after surgery where they may not feel as hungry. And so we do have to ensure that they're getting enough to eat as well. So gain enough nutrition um, as they're navigating, um, you know, eating less overall. What's texture difficulty? Yeah, so some patients uh, with really dry, tough textures will have issues after surgery with those types of foods. And it's something maybe that they haven't thought about uh, prior to surgery. So suddenly they're eating something that, you know, uh, is very common uh, uh, meal. And suddenly it is not uh, going down very well. It is uh, kind of feeling like it's getting stuck. Um, or they may even have, uh, you know, regurgitation of those uh, bites of food. So it is uh, discussing uh, maybe adding a sauce, uh, cooking it in a different uh, method where you're adding more moisture to those foods, still enjoying them, uh, but creating them in a way that's going to be better tolerated. You're able to chew them down better. Um, and so kind of having that discussion based on any uh, digestive complaints. Certainly not a one size fits all when it comes to nutrition for someone after a surgery like this. Uh, Jennifer mentioned protein as one of her goals. What other uh, goals do you expect to see? What are some of those top goals that you're talking with patients about as far as, um, uh, as achieving kind of that, that ultimate weight loss? Right, so as Jennifer mentioned, uh, we do talk about sugar sweetened beverages and encourage the avoidance of those. Um, not only from a weight loss perspective, but uh, sugar sweetened beverages can cause um, digestive irritation and what we call dumping syndrome. And so we, of course, want our patients to feel comfortable and have a good recovery and, uh, you know, kind of journey after surgery. And so uh, avoiding sugar sweetened beverages is huge. And uh, also being conscious of meal timing. Uh, mindful eating, uh, and then incorporating, um, you know, multivitamin supplementation, and of course, exercise. Um, exercise can't be ignored. Uh, good studies show that, you know, keeping an exercise regimen helps you keep the weight off long term. And so uh, while I am not a personal trainer, uh, that is definitely a conversation that uh, I have with patients as well as Dr. Rhodes, just kind of incorporating that lifestyle habit within their regimen. Well, Jennifer's getting after it when it comes to exercise. <laughs> uh, you basically have yes. like a home gym uh, here, right there. I mean, it's it's right there. You walk in and everything is there uh, very, very easy. 
um, to get to? What's your routine like? Uh, five o'clock in the morning, I get up, go downstairs, and I work out every day. Girl. It is my it is my happy time now. I never thought that working out would be so much fun and such a such an integral part of my life now. But if I don't do it, I don't have a good day. I have to get that time in. I think it gives me the endorphins. I feel good. I feel like I've done something good for my body. I feel like any food that I go in has been is going to nourish what I've done. Um, I'm very cheap, so I actually. Bought all that stuff off Facebook Marketplace. Good. I love the Marketplace, um, yes. Because it can be really expensive. Make your own home gym. You do, because going, I was, I tried the gyms, and I won't say which one I went to, but I did try the gyms, mm -hmm. and it wasn't for me. I didn't feel comfortable there. And so my husband's uberly supportive, and so we went to all different places in Kansas City and picked up fitness equipment. And I have my basement that used to be my family room is now my gym, and I love it. And it's really my happy place. Like, I do it every day. I don't even... And when I don't do it, I feel bad, so. Love that, love that, yeah. good discipline. Um, so Jennifer, what do you think would have happened uh, had you not have had the support of experts uh, like oh Dr. Gosh. Rhodes, Nicolette? Um, you know, this is, it's, it kind of takes a village when somebody's going down a big path like this. 100%, I feel, because I did a lot of research on the program, I did a huge research and I realized that the process is not just the surgery, it's the whole lifestyle that you're gonna have and it's gonna be a challenge. This is not a quick fix. This is not just mm -hmm. have the surgery and magically you're gonna be thin and, and happy. It, there's so many changes that happen. There's so many changes, and um, the entire team from Dr. Hugh to Dr. Rhodes and Nicolette, it has just been huge. And I'm so thankful that I chose KU for my weight loss surgery. So are we. Yeah. Make sure you ask your questions. Use the chat on YouTube or Facebook. You can tweet us or email the Medical News Network. Information is right there on your screen. Let's get a uh, Friday COVID count from Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. Good morning. Yeah. How are you? Hi, good. I'm glad it's Friday. I know. Um, yeah, right now, again, we have li li uh, a less amount of active COVID patients, 16 again from more of a peak of the, the low 30s a couple weeks ago. I think this is all a good trend. What we've seen from the CDC data and our data here is that the numbers of active inpatients are increasing, uh, sorry, are decreasing as well as the number of overall testing and positive tests are decreasing, not only for COVID, but of course for influenza and RSV as well. So ever since the very first COVID vaccines came out, some vaccine skeptics, yeah. uh, they were concerned about side effects like blood mm -hmm. clots. But Hawk, there's a new study out that's mm -hmm. proving the vaccine actually helped reduce the risk of blood clots. So yeah. who is that uh, study focused on? Yeah, I think it's important to remember, we know that COVID-19 alone can cause an increased risk of you getting blood clots. So blood clots in your legs, blood clots in your lungs, but also other thromboembolic events such as stroke in heart attack. So we know COVID-19 does that as well. We know that there was that issue with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that seemed to cause some blood clots in a very rare instances in people, blood clots um, in, their, in, their, um, in their skull. Um, so acting and understanding that, again, we know that COVID-19, the disease, makes you already at risk for blood clots. Um, what this study did was uh, go off of previous studies, which did show actually that the vaccines did help reduce your risk of blood clots. So we know that as well, that is already established. This study was a retrospective study of two different cohorts, two different groups. It was published in uh, the CDC's MMWR. And what it showed was that those people that received a bivalent uh, booster as compared to the people that had just received the monovalent boost, uh, the monovalent original vaccines, did have about a 50% decrease risk of blood clots even then. So these are people that are already getting the vaccine. They are higher risk because they are uh, end stage renal disease, so they are getting dialysis. Um, so they are at higher risk of complications anyways. But what they showed was that those people that did get that bivalent booster, as opposed to people who had just gotten the original monovalent uh, uh, vaccines, even with that, and especially with that receipt of that bivalent booster, did have about a 50% chance less of developing blood clots as well. So again, overall, I think that's good news. This is further evidence that these vaccines are safe and effective and can further help reduce the risk of uh, COVID-19 side effects or problems such as blood clots. All right, Pac, thanks so much. Yeah. Let's get to some questions from our viewers today. Uh, Nicolette, what's the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist? Great question. Uh, so a dietitian uh, is 
really going to um, be uh, someone who's licensed to, uh, you know, provide medical uh, nutrition um, education and medical medical nutrition therapy. Um, we are kind of held to a standard to um, ensure that we are, you know, staying updated on evidence-based uh, data for nutrition. With a nutritionist, there is less of a um, requirement for them to have a certain level of education. Uh, so we like to say anyone can call themselves a nutritionist, uh, but not everyone can call themselves a dietitian. Uh, we do have uh, standards within our um, career where we are trying to incorporate nutritionists into our title. So uh, a dietitian can be called a uh, registered dietitian nutritionist can go by nutritionist, um, but you know dietitians are definitely held to a higher standard, um, higher education, and uh, we are able to practice uh, medical nutrition therapy. Thank you for educating us on that. I think that's a good question too. Question for you, Dr. Rhodes: Do people ever regret getting this surgery? You know, I'd say rarely. I've I've seen it. Um, Honestly, most of the times that we see folks in that category, it's more of a timing issue. So maybe not that mm -hmm. the surgery itself is something they should have done, but think that there were so many other things maybe going on in life, or maybe they felt a little bit more like this was someone else's decision. Maybe this was a different provider or someone else in their life kind of pushing this. Those are the times when we see people say like, this didn't feel like a good fit. So those are some of the things we talk to people about ahead mm -hmm. of time. Um, to try to make sure that this is truly their decision and be really strategic about the timing. You were shaking your head, Jennifer. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. If I had tried to do this when I had small children, for me, it wouldn't have worked. Now that my children are grown, I'm able to focus so much more on myself and my fitness, like going downstairs and exercising instead of making my kids breakfast and getting them ready for the bus. That's a change in my life, that this was the time for me to really take this choice and take this trip down having weight loss surgery. Timing is Absolutely. everything. Timing was huge. Last question for you, a couple of food related questions. Uh -huh. What was the hardest thing to give up? <laughs> um, Diet Coke was hardest okay. thing to give up, to be quite honest, before surgery. That was really hard. I was huge on that. Um, uh, I've made modifications though because I have a, fin uh, a ninja uh, creamy, so I'm able to make ice cream out of my weight loss shakes nice. or other stuff. So I've modified some things, so I haven't really given up certain things. I've just made them healthier and modified them so I can still have some things in my life. So you're not missing some of those right. things. I like that. That's that's a good tip. Anything you can't tolerate anymore? No, I've gotten pretty good. At the beginning, I couldn't tolerate meat very well, mm -hmm. but um, now I can pretty much eat everything. I just eat slower and I eat a lot smaller portions. Great so. conversation today. I want to get our takeaways. Nicolette, I'll start with you. What do you want people to take away? Bariatric surgery is, uh, you know, not a magic wand. And there is definitely uh, some habits that you can't uh, go through this surgery and into that lifestyle um, and continue to, you know, kind of go along thinking that you don't have to change much. Um, as Jennifer has showed us, you know, we've, she's established healthy eating, uh, protein intake, uh, consistent exercise. And so while this is a life changing, um, surgery, it, you need, you need other tools in that toolbox to support you long-term. And, um, so, you know, Jennifer has showed that it's, it's persistence, it's, um, you know, holding herself accountable and, um, applying a lot of these lifestyle habits and, um, you know, not, you know, saying that the surgery is going to do all the work you have to do, uh, that work as well. Dr. Rhodes, what do you want people to know? Oh, well, it's hard to top that. I would echo everything Nicolette <laughs> just said. Um, and also just note, you know, as we talked about earlier, there's a lot of misinformation and stigma out there related to not only obesity, but also related to the surgery process. Um, and so that can be really, those can be barriers for folks to even be exploring their options, including bariatric surgery. Um, so I would just say, if this is something you're interested in, we encourage you to come in with an open mind and just know that there are supports to help you kind of support short and long term, uh, no matter what. And we want to be a part of that process. And we hope that people have the experience that Jennifer has had. But what well, a beautiful example. Thank you, ladies, for both being with us today. Jennifer, I will let you wrap us up. What's the big takeaway from your story? The big takeaway is don't be, don't be scared. 
reach out, do your research, um, know that it's a lifestyle change, and um, just reach out to KU. They're a great program, and I highly recommend um, everyone here. Thank you for that, and thank you for being with us today and sharing your story. We appreciate you. Well, thank you to all of our viewers as well for being with us today. As we head into the weekend, we say good luck to the Chiefs as well as our doctors traveling to Baltimore for the Sunday's AFC Championship game. The forecast looks windy and wet, but relatively warm. Temperatures in mid-40s, so much, much nicer than the weather we saw a couple weeks ago. We caught up with two of our sports medicine physicians while they were in between patients and asked them to look ahead to this weekend's matchup. Dr. Luke Thompson. I'm one of the primary care sports medicine physicians for our health system and the Chiefs as well. It's fun to at least have a game or two where, where it's just a little bit different and you're dealing with some snow or rain and that kind of thing. And once you're out there, you kind of forget it's happening. For people who are going to be watching the game, you know, making sure you're layering up, making sure, especially wearing a layer that's good and protective against the rain, waterproof, so that you can keep that water off you because if the, the water gets inside and you're wet, it doesn't matter how many layers you have, they're all going to be wet and that's going to make you extra cold. I'm Dr. J.P. Darge. I'm a sports medicine physician for the health system, and I'm also a team physician for the Kansas City Chiefs. Touchdown, Kansas City! I think pretty much every single player would rather play in a, in a warmer, you know, 70s to 80s is usually probably the most comfortable. These guys are professionals, and that's what they do. They, I don't think they overly stress about it. They just figure it out. They've been through it many times before. The biggest thing is handling the ball. So anybody that, you know, the center, the quarterback, receivers, handling the ball always makes it. The ball looks different. Uh, it feels different, especially in the, in, the, in the really bad cold. Anytime you get to the AFC Championship, you know, you feel pretty good uh, about your accomplishments. Certainly not done, but um, I think they can look forward to a, a really good matchup uh, between two really good teams, probably the two best teams in the AFC right now. <laughs> Coming up Monday on the Morning Medical Update. It's time to go beyond just managing symptoms. Two breakthrough treatments are rewriting the narrative of sickle cell anemia. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Morning Medical Update. Gene editing for a healthier future. The hope and hurdles of these brand new therapies. Monday at 8. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available. Heard with stuff, but like, what are we doing? What's not the time of day?